Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff. It is Wednesday, August the 26th and today I wanted to talk a little bit about ethics. I think that it is often um, elided from modern discussions about meditation, this idea that ethics has anything to do with meditation at all. Um, it's a peculiarity given that historical teachings of meditation make ethics the foundation of meditation. So if you're running around killing people or uh, cheating on your spouse or um, otherwise committing crimes, telling lies, um, using harsh words even, that you are really not in any position to even begin meditating, much less um, become an expert meditator. And I think that uh, particularly in the West, there tends to be a combination of images of the martial arts and meditation as as though they're sort of two sides of the same coin and this idea that um, the exceptionally violent um, are capable <laughs> uh, of not only of meditating but of meditating expertly um, this is actually untrue it's very hard to explain uh, without experience why ethics matters so much, but it is worth going over the framework which is used in historical contexts for teaching meditation. That framework tends to be a, a three-level um, structure. It's, it's often broken down into more pieces. Um, it, it's often seen in different ways, but the three-level structure is very basically, um, first, shil, sila, um, depending on which pronunciation system uh, you're coming from, the, either the Sanskrit or um, the Pali. Sila in Pali leads to samadhi, um, samatha, uh, other words, basically concentration practices. Um, sila are the ethics. Don't kill any other living being. Don't hurt anyone intentionally. Don't tell lies. Don't cheat on your spouse. Samadhi concentration depends on these ethics. And beyond concentration is this idea of Panya, Pragya, Insight. Um, these three stages are not always positioned in this kind of <laughs> linear one after the other structure, but um, there is certainly a strong codependence from one to the other. And um, the way that these are structured in Vipassana meditation is um, precisely in this way. So they are structured that in, in a way where you require ethics first, then Anapana meditation is used as a, a focusing, concentrating meditation. And then Vipassana meditation, meditation on bodily sensations, is the third step and most serious step. Um, in some ways it's also the most important, but um, it's, Vipassana is um, the first step to be taken after many other first steps. So these other first steps can involve us trying to elevate ourselves through the different kinds of ethics which exist and Trying to capture ethics for ourselves um, is not always easy. 
So there was, there was certainly a point in my life where I thought to myself, I, I probably shouldn't be eating animals. It's not that big a deal, but um, I know that it hurts them. It's not necessary. I have access to plenty of other proteins and nutrients. Um, I like I'm I'm in the world's one percent. I I'm not lacking for access to food. Um, there are people in the world for whom meat is an absolutely essential uh, source of nutrients, um, and it's silly and and somewhat rude to look to someone else and say oh you shouldn't eat x you shouldn't eat y it's bad for you um i actually think that 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 mode of thinking is extremely unhelpful um and it's also a bit puerile uh, to look to other people and try to tell them how to behave. Um, but that's a topic for another time. Um, the topic of interest here in my personal experience was going through this exercise of figuring out, okay, like to what extent is my consumption of meat um, harming other creatures and how much do I care? Um, and as it turns out, uh, my concern for the cows and the sheep and the um, delicious pigs that I was eating um, was not that high. It was, it was really helpful for me to form a framework, an ethical framework around the consumption of meat, which involved a concern for the environment on the whole. So um, the environment here in India, where I was living, but also the environment back home in Canada, where I'm from. Um, and the idea that um, A, eating meat is bad for the environment. B, eating meat is kind of bad for me. I don't feel particularly healthy when I eat a lot of meat. I tend to get fat. Um, I tend to get a bit lazy. <laughs> My digestion is worse. Um, and then see, okay, yes, also these animals are being harmed in the process of me eating the meat. Um, I'm creating the, the demand um, through which a butcher supplies. Um, and together, these three things allowed me to create a small ethical framework for myself. Um, there is no guarantee that I won't at some point in the future eat meat again. I have no idea, but at the moment, um, that's not the case. And there are many other small things in life. Um, so there, there's a huge delta between being the consumer and being the producer. And so... I've heard a lot of arguments over the past few years about, oh, there's this, this hip hop artist, right? So and so. And it's found that they're a terrible person and they've hurt somebody or they've done something wrong. Um, should I stop listening to his music? And the answer is probably in the grand scheme of things, your capacity as a consumer your capacity on the demand side of the equation, the economic equation, matters very little. Um, it matters more in terms of your awareness and more in terms of um, the downstream consequences of what are the markets that you're involved in, what are the corporations that service those markets, and these sorts of questions are, are useful to ask ourselves, but they're, they're not necessarily the most valuable ethical questions that we can ask. Um, there are much more direct ethical actions that we can take. We can help other people. We can um, 
do this in many ways, right? We can lend a hand physically. We can support someone um, by, you know, offering our time. We can lend ourselves to someone financially. And when I say lend, I mean essentially donate. We can support, say, a nonprofit school or a library. We, we can do much with our finances. Um, and if we have nothing else, we have our words. So we can help other people with those things that we say. We can choose our words a little more carefully and uh, a little more intentionally. And what you'll find, oddly enough, is that this choice to explore our ethics, to try to enhance and uplift our ethics, so a really foundational level of ethics. I, this was described um, by Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, who is a monk in the United States, in a lecture I heard of his recently. He described ethics as having these kinds of tiers. And as non-monks, only three of two of the three tiers <laughs> Um, are really of any significance to us. So the first tier is basic ethics. I know not to kick that dog. I know not to steal someone else's belongings. I know not to tell lies, white lies or any other kind of lies. I know not to say hurtful words. Um, these are fundamental ethics, societal ethics. Everyone knows these things are wrong. When you go to do one of these things, you feel it inside. You know, oh, okay, I'm about to do something wrong. I should stop. And usually we stop ourselves. Then above that, there is this kind of engendered ethic. So I will go out of my way to support a school. I will go out of my way to help someone who is down on their luck. I will go out of my way to say some kind words to someone who needs it. Um, this engendered ethic is somewhat more in flux, somewhat more dependent on our current mental state, and it requires constant effort. And that is the effort of <clears throat> the beginning. Um, this uh, this idea, did I, did I have Vipassana over here or did I have it over here? I don't remember. <laughs> Whichever side has, has the ethics on it. Um, these engendered ethics are the ethics uh, of the beginning. The third tier, I'll call it out because um, I assume people, if they're watching this, might be curious. The third tier is to rid oneself of the capacity to make mistakes. Um, to rid oneself of the capacity to commit unwholesome, unethical actions. Um, this is what the life of the, the monk or the nun is for. The monastic life is intended to um, direct a person toward meditation in such a single-minded way that their meditative practice eliminates desires and greed and anger and all the other negative emotions that we feel as human beings. Um, one presumably will not do this <laughs> meditating for 10, 20 minutes a day, one, two hours a day as a lay person. We can keep our anger at bay. We can keep our greed at bay, um, but they'll still be around. We're not, we're not in the process of destroying these things. Um, that's probably mostly for, for the monastics. Um, and I'll go back to this idea. It, it's surprising to find how much it really matters um, to have this foundation of ethics in place. And you'll find that if you are trying, putting an effort into these engendered ethics um, 
to uh, to respect people's time, to give people your time, to really put in the right energy into helping others, um, and to find ways to help others um, more meaningfully and um, more effectively, that those ethics really start to help you in your meditation. Um, and you wouldn't think, right? Why would, uh, why would ethical behavior have anything to do with my ability to concentrate? And that's all we're talking about. We're just talking about anapana meditation. This is center point, um, not even vipassana. Um, and I, I don't think I can entirely explain. Um, my, my best explanation is this, that um, the reason that we are distracted, the reason that we cannot focus is because our body, our mind is a mass of biochemical reactions. We are, we're no different from the pig or the sheep, really. Um, we're reacting to external inputs. We are processing them. We may think harder than, than a sheep, um, although we probably give ourselves more credit than we deserve. Um, but the processes with which we do that thinking are not really different from those of the sheep. Ultimately, we have reactionary organs, including the brain, which process information and then arrive at a conclusion. We compute an answer and we say, I'm going to kick the dog or I'm not going to kick the dog. Um, and when it comes to distraction, um, it's these biological processes happening in the body that we can't remain focused on one thing that constantly the mind is jumping somewhere else. It's because of everything that's going on inside us. I mean, there's nothing else to us. Um, I won't go out of my way to proclaim that, that there is no soul or there's no uh, self, um, but in a strict biological sense, your mind is not somewhere else. Your consciousness is not somewhere else. It is here in your body, wrapped up in this pile of meat and this pile of meat inter interacts, right? Integrates with itself um, in a pretty cohesive way, thanks to evolution. But um, there's nothing magical going on here. Um, and so if you believe in the soul or you believe in magic, leave that aside. Um, but surely even with the, a soul in the picture, you still have the mass of meat, right? And the mass of meat interacts with your mental processing. And with that in place, with understanding that framework, um, the physical framework of the body at a very gross level, at a very high level, we can say, oh, okay, have I ever committed an action that has really hurt me? Um, stolen something? Even as a child, think back to being a child. Did you ever steal something that really wasn't yours? Um, and preferably a situation where you weren't caught, right? You probably still have slivers of guilt. I have, I have, right? I stole a box of chocolates when I was maybe five or six years old. And I remember it distinctly. I remember sneaking it into my pocket and I was caught. My mother, <laughs> my mother caught me with the box of chocolates and took me back to the store and made me apologize. Um, and the, the guilt um, was pre-societal in some ways. Um, I knew I was doing something wrong and, um, and I did it anyway. And I could feel how much it hurt to do the wrong thing. And this is the mind-body complex at work, right? Um, so your mind knows, I'm going to point to the brain, that's not really where the mind is, but let's stick with that, you know, 
<laughs> unfounded idea. Um, the mind says, okay, you're doing something wrong. And the body responds. And if it really feels like you're doing something exceptionally wrong, sometimes the body will respond in violent ways. Um, if you really hurt someone's feelings, you'll find a, a similar physical response, right? This kind of burning and clenching of the body inside. Um, and it, it is this that prevents us from this basic act of concentration. So it's because um, these things have been disconnected in modern meditation practices um, that it's perhaps easier to explain if what I'm doing is selling you an app or if I'm selling you a yoga class it's easier to explain that meditation is a way for you to relax and have a better sleep and focus at work and be more effective in your career um, you don't really want to make a part of the sales pitch uh, ethics on the whole, right? Because that's very complicated. Um, but they are fundamentally linked. And as soon as you start to engage ethics, to lift yourself, try to lift, I am still trying to lift myself to this second tier of ethics, um, you'll find that your meditation practice becomes much stronger and in some ways much easier. Um, so I would encourage you to do that, uh, assuming you are also trying to engage in a meditation practice to actively look at your ethics. Active, uh, you don't need to stop eating meat if you're eating meat. <laughs> Take your own time with whatever roads you're walking down. Um, uh, not there is no singular framework for ethics that works for all of us. We need to, we need to figure our own way through all of that. So um, take that little story with a grain of salt. But I encourage you to investigate your own ethics and figure out, oh, okay, what are my ethics? Why are these my ethics? And how can I improve them? And then see how that interacts with your meditation uh, practice. This has been a slightly long one today. I apologize for that. I hope you're all taking good care of yourselves, taking good care of your family. I will talk to you tomorrow.